What's up, monkeys? Welcome back to the Pleasure Monkey Podcast. On this episode, we are going to be kicking it with my homie, Kyle Kingsbury. He is the director of human optimization at Onnit. He is also the host of the Onnit Podcast. He has a little experience with our good friend, Ayahuasca, and that is what we dive into in this episode. He has, if we're going to tally it up, 22 ceremonies under his belt and a fuck ton of learning. I don't think there's much more of an intro needed. This is a fantastic podcast. We go through experiences, lessons taken away, and really take the time to dive deep into how we have applied what Mother Ayahuasca has given us into our day-to-day lives. It's beautiful. It's amazing. You're going to love it. But before we jump into the show, we got to do a little business. Onnit.com is your home for all things optimization. And I want to bring a little light to the new and improved Onnit podcast hosted by today's guest, Kyle Kingsbury. He is the equivalent of a human guinea pig up at Onnit, and he's been trying out and exploring different ways to improve gut health, improve cognitive function, improve physical performance, and having conversations with some of the leaders in health and personal development. Now, I don't know a lot of people that can apply what they learn and what they explore like Kyle. The only person that I might be able to compare him to is uh, Ben Greenfield, who is basically an alien. But Kyle is always trying new things, always exploring new strategies for growth and development. And it's one of the reasons I love the guy so much. So if you haven't checked out the new On It podcast, go give it a listen, subscribe, write a kind review for our good homie Kyle, and uh, just enjoy. And as always, if you're looking to get some of the best no bullshit supplements and equipment that you're going to find anywhere, you can go to onit.com slash monkey, and you're going to get yourself 10% off and show the pleasure monkey podcast a little love as well here's the deal life's too short to dress like a fucking jabroni and that's why the pleasure monkey podcast has partnered with our homies over at hate brand goods now you know i like to work out obviously you see me with my shirt off if you follow my instagram and i'm rocking that slightly above average dad bod and that takes a lot of work and i also like to look good while i'm in the gym and i also like to wear gym clothes out on the town and still look good. This is a really, really complicated part of my life, but hate brand goods helps me accomplish this. And I'm just proud that they're a part of what we got going on here. I also drink coffee out of the kick the day in the dick coffee mug every morning. And it helps me as I journal about all my wandering thoughts into my morning pages and uh, look out the window at the beautiful world that I'm creating with my consciousness. Now, if you want 15% off, you can also drop in that keyword monkey at checkout and uh, support the show just a little bit. So if you want to check this out, it is thehate.com, T-H-E, and then H followed by the Roman numeral eight. Cute, huh? H-V-I-I-I.com. So that's T-H-E-H-V-I-I-I.com. Code word monkey at checkout for 15% off all the goodness. And now here's the show with my homie and soul brother, Kyle Kingsbury. All right, brother. So one thing that we share and the reason I wanted to bring you on today is to dive deep into one thing. And that's ayahuasca. We allude to it with a lot of the shows and we've talked about experiences, but you have by far the most experience of anybody that I'm close to in that medicine space and with the tribes and the people who harvest and brew and facilitate. So uh, I just want to turn it over to you, man, and let's let's dive into this stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Let's dive into all things Aya, the Aya episode of Pleasure Monkey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when you told me this was the idea for, for... to have me back on, I was like, fuck yeah, man. That's that's awesome because you're right. Like every time, I mean, if we're, you know, obviously you and I will do a fitness podcast and that shit doesn't come up, you know, yeah. not the right audience or you're talking about something, that, you know, yeah, you, you talk to the right people, you're with people that, that have gotten down before, it's going to come up in conversation, but it's not 
the entire topic. Yeah. So it, it is and one cool. thing, one thing with people that I have around, and I'm you know super grateful to have you around often, is that we can just say let's let's dive deep into one thing. Mm-hmm. Like I've had you've been on the show a couple of times. We've done a couple of different things, but you know we have these conversations off air, and I, and I feel like they're just super valuable, and people are always really curious, not only about the intellectual piece and and the the facts and figures, but the experiences that we've we've had, and you in particular have some and. Uh, that have really kind of blown my mind even. So hell yeah, brother. Well where do we start? <laughs> uh, let's start with I, I let's start with the first time for you. First time. So let's see here. Tiptoeing around uh legal issues. Let's just say <laughs> that uh uh you can either go to the Amazon where it is legal and not a problem, or uh rumor has it that there are some places around uh the US where they practice and uh some of those might be on Native American reservations where potentially there's a legal gray area there. And um, at the very least, you don't have people poking their heads around, asking questions. And, yeah. And, um, but yeah, you know, I think um, the first time for me was something that I was, you know, I had read about it on uh, the vaults of Arrowhead. People know of, of Arrowhead. It's E-R-O-W-I-D dot org. It's a fantastic website. I use it all through college. They basically break down every psychoactive chemical known to man, Mm -hmm. from caffeine to nicotine to meth to DMT to ayahuasca to everything. And they break down the chemical profile, what's in it, the legalities of it, where it's legal, where it's not legal, and they even have trip reports. So it's like it was around. It's like an OG website. It is totally OG. Internet, porn, Reddit, Narrowood. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was that, those are the three things that you were into. <laughs> you know, as I was saying, that's, that's, that's the progress. Oh, like, okay. You can send emails, then we'll there's porn and immediately, and then, then there was yeah. like, oh shit, there's this, there's this thing where people can talk about their experiences with yeah. plants. Yeah. So I, you know, I had a buddy, I had done some, uh, some work with, um, uh, Native Americans doing like traditional tamas calls and sweat lodges and using psilocybin in a different way, you know, like a different way than I was accustomed to with, respect and intention, a lot of the same things that transfer over to an ayahuasca ceremony. And I had seen, you know, dramatic change in what I had gotten out of those. And so I had a buddy that was going to Peru to do Machu Picchu. And uh, he hit me up from Peru. He was like, hey, man, uh, so I've only got so many days here. I can either hike Machu Picchu or do ayahuasca. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Hike Machu Picchu. What is this shit? What is this Aya stuff? And he was like, no, 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 dude. You need to look into it. He's like, Google it now. And so, uh, you know, I went to Arrowhead and it said it was the apex of teacher plants. And so right then I was like, oh, shit. You know, like we got to dive into this one. And so I had this, a deep calling, as they would say. You know, I really wanted to do it. I really thought I could have a lot of transformation. But it's funny because, um. You know, you read about La Perga and the, the puking and shitting and possibly shitting your pants. And thankfully, even though I've crept my pants many times with MCT oil, <laughs> still have not crept my pants on ayahuasca. And, um, but yeah, you know, like there's, it's, you know, like you listen to a guy like Gabra Mate and he says he gets nervous every time. There's a guy who's done it hundreds of times. And uh, Dennis McKenna has done it hundreds of times. And he says he feels like an infant with ayahuasca. Yeah. It feels new to him every time. So like these kind of things really intrigued me. And uh, Dan Hardy was actually there at my first ceremony. Oh, really? Yeah. And Dan had done it 15 times. His beautiful and awesome goddess of a wife, Lacey, had done it 20. Wow. So the, I looked at them as like, you know, these guys are fucking legendary. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I sat right next to them in our space. So I felt like I could draw strength from them when times were tough. But, you know, like going into it, having the first cup of tea and, they go through all the prep and you do the dieta and all this stuff. And I remember seeing like all these people eating potato chips and shit like that the night before. And I'm like, that's not on the fucking dieta. And all these judgments came up, Yeah, you know, like in all these, this long standing issue that I had always had. I talked about this a little bit on Rogan's, but this long standing issue that I had with obese people yeah. where I looked at them like, why are you fucking treating yourself like this? Like it's a choice. It is a choice. Why are you doing this to your body? You only get one body. Whether we die and it goes black, like fucking (laughs) Sam Harris thinks and Richard Dawkins, or we go to heaven, or we have multiple lives after this and we get new bodies, this is the only fucking body we get right now. So it did, you know, it was something that had bothered me since I was young. And, uh, you know, as the ceremony started, 
you have the noble silence. You're not looking around. I'm keeping my eyes closed, not trying to invade people's privacy, just trying to meditate, waiting for it to kick in. And uh, I was one of the last people to have a cup. So I'm, it starts to sound like a war zone, like people are like fucking just turning inside out. And uh, it sounded like animal sounds, you know, like these, if you ever heard someone purge, it's just fucking balls deep, like turning yourself inside out and um, not opening my eyes, not looking around. I was just imagining like what was going on. And then I realized, oh, they're puking. Oh, okay. They're puking because they don't eat clean. They're puking because they treat themselves like shit. Mm-hmm. They're puking because <laughs> fill in the blank judgment, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, but it just snowballs. And for me, it was like almost anger towards others and really trying to hold myself in this high regard. Like, oh, I'm not going to puke. I treat, you know, I eat clean. I lift weights. I do this. I do that. And it just fucking snowballed until I started to feel sick from it. And I was getting sick from the anger and I was getting more mad because I was getting angry in the first place and it didn't feel good as, as I started to feel nauseated. I was like, why the fuck would anyone do ever do this? You know, thinking that in my head, like this is the dumbest shit I've ever done. And then rah, just fucking leaned up and grabbed my bucket and turned myself inside out. And as that, as the puke left my body, the anger left my body. Yeah. And I had like this deep compassion, like, fuck, they don't know. Maybe they didn't fucking grow up the way that I did. Maybe they weren't introduced to sports at 10 years old like I was. Maybe they didn't have a dad who wrestled with them every single day since he was a little toddler. Mm-hmm. All those, I could see it from all fucking angles. And I was like, wow. And then purge again, boom. And uh, I thought that I set my bucket down and laid back. But my one of the guides told me later that actually threw my head back and fucking convulsed, like full on like almost seizure, like full body shaking. And I could hear this whisper from two of the guides saying, what should we do? Should we touch him? Should we put cold water on him? Is he okay? And then I heard um, uh, the guy that I had worked with many times tell me like, no, he, he knows he's safe. And right then it was like, whew, no more shaking and just deep peace. And I was a full body sweat. And I remember rubbing my eyes and it felt like the most euphoric ecstasy I've ever felt in my life. I was like, oh my God, like this just, I could rub my eyes for hours and just have the most complete pleasure from that. And the next thought was, oh, but I didn't come here from that. You know, I've done ecstasy. I've done a lot of things just to feel good, Mm -hmm. just to change, you know, my waking state of consciousness for feeling and euphoria. And that's cool, but that's not why I'm here. And I remember my intention. And, uh, one of those intentions was, uh, my girlfriend at the time was my wife now, Natasha was to kind of figure out like, why do we butt heads so often? You know? And so immediately I slipped into my first vision where I became her and I relived every argument we've ever had up until that point, but as her and I had curly hair and boobs and I'm staring up at Kyle who's got a foot taller and I'm just (laughs) screaming at Kyle and every word coming out of Natasha's mouth was in a way that Kyle would understand it. And when I came out of that back as me, just fucking floodgates. I mean, I cried like I'd never cried before. And it was so beautiful because it was the deepest perspective shift I'd ever experienced in my life. Like I knew in every circumstance, it was love coming from her. But through my filter and through my previous experience of arguments with girlfriends, of arguments with my parents, of everything that had gone on in my life, I didn't see it the way she wanted me to hear it. Yeah. You know, and that yeah. blew me away. It totally blew me away. Dude, isn't that like, doesn't that give you so much context? Like, it does. I, I actually, it's funny. We've talked about this so many times. I don't think I've ever like walked through the first experience with you. Yeah. Like but I mean, it's just, it is, that's the whole thing. And Dennis says this too, when he talks about the difference between modern religion and the psychedelic experience is that it's not somebody telling you, this is what you should believe in. This is what, this is what happened. This is how you should live your life. It is direct experience. Exactly. And you could say that's direct experience with God, with source, with mother ayahuasca, whatever, however you want to label that it's direct experience for you. Yeah. And it's not like, I mean, if you see puff, the magic dragon flying by, <laughs> it's going to tell you something for yeah. you that you need to hear. It's not just going to be some weird shit where you're like, Oh, that was cool and random and, and meant nothing to me. Like, yeah. no, not at all. Like it's, it's very important, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, soon after that, I thought of my mom and at the time fighting in the UFC, not making shit for money. I was still living in mom's garage and, uh, 
So <laughs> we, we had been butting heads quite often and, um, I became my mother and she was young and I looked down on my belly and I could watch it grow like time-lapse video, <laughs> this belly growing with Kyle inside and being a mom for the first time with her firstborn child and just all the fear and anxiety of being a first time parent and wanting to do your fucking very best. Like the nervousness of being a mom for the first time. Am I ready? Like feeling all that as my mom. And then every time Rick, my dad would come over and kiss my belly and give it love. I could feel fucking energy from him shoot through the stomach and touch <laughs> the baby inside me. But also as mom, I could feel his energy radiating as he put hands on my belly. It was fucking magnificent, you know? And then coming out of that, you're like, well, shit. It doesn't mean I'm not going to argue with my parents, but, um, you know, a lot of parents will say like, you'll never know how much I love you until you have a child of your own. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, I kind of get it now. I kind of yeah. get it. Yeah. Even yeah. before having bear, like I definitely, definitely saw things differently. I definitely understood like, and so many times in ceremony, you can see things, you live it, you experience it through the other person. It's, you know, you do walk a mile in their shoes. So it, it really does paint a different picture on what you understand, what they're going through and, and the decisions they make. It was, you know, my fourth ceremony was the only one that I had really diving into my childhood and growing up. And through all the the, the shit of it that I didn't like, that I remembered as being fucking terrible, that I don't want my kids to go through, there was no blame. There was yeah. no fuck you for this or you guys did this wrong. There was compassion. Yeah, I saw the fear they lived with of trying to put food on the table, of not knowing how to communicate with one another properly. So they constantly fucking butted heads like two rams in the living room, <laughs> you know, <laughs> every fucking night, you know, and it's like, those are my memories. But now I see them differently. Now I see like these were fucking kids raising kids. And when I had yeah. Bear, I, that was the first thought that I had. Like I was, uh, what am I, 35? So I was 33 when I had Bear. And I thought, I'm a fucking child raising a child. Yeah. And then I thought back, like my dad was 31. He was a fucking child raising a child. Like there is no manuscript for that. There is no, this is what you do when you're a parent. Here's the guidebook, you know, and fucking that's how, what do you think the shelves are covered with books on how to raise kids? There's yeah, 30 right. books on just how to put them to bed at night, you know? What you're like expecting, that. you're expecting. Yeah. And on yeah. and on and on. Yeah. But, and it's like uh, Robert Kiyosaki's, uh, you know, he's got the rich dad, poor dad for marketing, rich dad, poor dad for real estate agents, <laughs> rich dad, poor, poor dad for fucking female teens. You know, there's like 50 <laughs> spinoffs. <female> <laughs> It's just, it's ridiculous, right? But it's the same thing with kids. And so just to have that really changed the way, not only like the compassion I have for my parents and the way they raised me, but also kind of uh, being able to forgive myself for the way I raised mm -hmm. Bear. Like, look, you know, we're going to make mistakes as parents and that's okay. Like, I don't need to beat myself over it, up over it. I just need to learn from it. And if I can learn from it, then I can change faster so we don't make that mistake again. And so he has... You know, every goal of a parent is to give to their child what their parent didn't give to them, Yeah. you know, so that you can have them live the life you wish you had when you were a kid. You can do that going forward. You can't, you can't change the past, but you can rewrite the future. Yeah, you know? exactly. And that's a fucking cool thing to realize. It is. It is. And I think this is something, something that Mark Manson talks about that I really resonate with. And it's the value of emotional diversity. Right, like feeling hurt, feeling pain, fear, and then having to work yourself out of it gives you the tools required to continue to grow. Like you have to have ex experience diversity of emotions and experience to develop these tools. And then you take those with you and you have those as you go on. And you can share those with other people. And when you want to be in a place to do that, whether that's your kids or whether that's your audience or whatever that is, you can then share experiential learnings. And that's one thing I think when you talk about being a parent and one thing I got from my first, it was my third ceremony, but in my first or third time drinking, but in the first uh, ceremony I had was my, my mom got pregnant with me when she was 19, 100% accident, right? So there was a lot of stuff and she was also, you know, had, had addiction issues and there was a lot of stuff there and uh, it was, it was wild, but I, I started to see the value from a very high place of that experience for me and the gift that I was given by that experience and, and my perspective from it and, and was able to 
what I was felt like I was hanging out with this, this Christ type character that was like Jesus, Buddha and Alan Watts all rolled into one that was kind of communicating <laughs> with me. And, and, and we were, and we were sitting together observing our humanity and laughing at the way that modern religion works, not in a, like not laughing at it, but just kind of laughing at how silly our, our human nature is. And then understanding that to forgive for sins is to have compassion for those that you love and to lead with that and view with that. And then everyone has the power to for, forgive of sins, right? It's, that's not, that's the, that's the divine within you and not the divine above you. Yeah. And man, it was a really, it was a really curious experience, but I, I, it, it gave me such a different context. I used to just torture my mom for all the things, you know, and I was able to finally let go of that. And not that we don't, we still fight every now and then, but it's, I can, I can take a step back and view with a little bit of compassion th- towards that. And it, and that again, more, ex- more diversity of emotions and more tools gained. Yeah. Well, I think there's, there's a couple things there. There's the, you know, Experiencing all the things uh, and the polarity of things is often like a deep psychedelic experience does, whether that's a heroic dose of psilocybin or ayahuasca mm-hmm. or something that's on that level, you begin to see things, the good and the bad. And I talked about this with Aubrey, uh, the podcast we did after Burning Man with the, you know, going back to Eckhart Tolle in A New Earth, is that so? You know, like everything that bad, <laughs> the fucking bad happens, is that so? Like you don't, the master knows that there is no judgment to be made at this point because a day from now or a year from now or 10 years from now, you may look back on that and that could have been the greatest gift to you. Yeah. It's only in the eye of the hurricane where you're like, fuck this. I don't want to experience <laughs> this. You know what I'm saying? So I think having going through the trials and tribulations of life and having the challenges, not the stress, but the challenges that life throws at us, that you only get better from that. Right. And, I, and I've talked with you and the mind pump guys before about the the squat analogy. I like, you know, like you, you're not going to get stronger if you just keep lifting weights with the bar. Yeah. You're right. You got to add weight. You got to mm-hmm. change the stressor or you have to change the dynamic, make it a squat jump or make yeah. it a fucking lunge or do something to add the stress so that way you continue to make improvements. If this was a fucking utopia, it wouldn't be much of a fun game. It'd be, it'd be, it's like uh, when you play a video game with a uh, game genie. And you've got unlimited <laughs> yeah. lives, unlimited ammo, unlimited yeah. everything. It's like, this game sucks now. I used yeah. all the codes. It's not even fun. I just walk through people <laughs> and they explode on impact. You know, like, yeah. this is stupid. So I think that, that it's important that we have those things and that we view them that way because mm-hmm. it is perspective in all things. Like, the amount of challenges you have in your life, you never finish. There is no fucking end game to self-growth or to awareness or to awakening. There's no like, ah, I made it to the top of the mountain. Now you get yeah. to fuck off and re- retire from <laughs> no, personal it's growth. No, like it's I, nothing but eternal bliss from now on. Yep. And, you know, I don't have to try anymore. It just I is. made it. The rest of the world yeah. is perfect. I'm perfect and we're all good to go. Like, no, that doesn't happen. And it doesn't happen on purpose. Like we're, we're supposed to keep having challenges. We're supposed yeah. to keep learning and to keep having those things. And that gives us situational awareness yeah and with that awareness that's all it all it takes right because then as the situation comes back up with the parents maybe the knee-jerk reaction is still there but very quickly after that it's the awareness that reminds you like oh wait yeah ah all right take a deep breath this doesn't i don't need to be bothered by this okay it doesn't bother me and then how can i communicate better with my mom so that she's not bothered by it, right? Yeah. Like, so it doesn't mean that you're fucking perfect right off the bat the next time you encounter that, but it means you're able to, you're able to change the way you react to things much faster than you did in the past because you've gone through it. And with time and applying that, you repattern your, your reactions. Mm -hmm. You react with knowing that you need to take space or create space there, create space for compassion to get it, to jump in or else it's just going to be that, that nerve that gets that gets pinged every time, you know, and that's yeah. that's where it comes down. It just take it just takes reps, just it like it takes squatting. the reps. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I think the biggest the, one of the biggest things that I've gotten from in no particular uh, ayahuasca ceremony that I could put my finger on is, but just like kind of like a back end pointer towards meditation. Yeah, and I've I had practiced breath work and meditation in my fight career to try to zero in that way I could, you know, be in the cage and not be, you know, in panic mode, thinking of all Mm -hmm. the outcomes and all the bullshit that comes up in a fight just to be a hundred percent present, non-reactive and just go, you know? And, uh, I didn't really get it until somewhere along the line in ceremony. I understood what my quiet center was. I understood what peace was. Yeah. 
And then that kind of re-engineered my ability to get there faster in a regular meditation without the use of substances, yeah. you know? And I think that's, it's funny because so many yogis or different practitioners of different things all heading towards the same place. They're like, Oh, don't use that stuff. It's a, you know, it's a cheat code or, Oh, don't use that stuff. You've got to, <laughs> you know, spend 30 years in, on the mountain to get there. And, uh, I think it's silly to try to say what, what you know, this thing is better than that thing. It's yeah. like my religion is better than your religion or my God knows more than yours or this, yeah. this Zen is better than your Zen. It's like, no dude, if it works for you, that's great. And if there's something to be learned, great. But I mean, I, I just, I like using that example because you do need some type of practice in the day to day when you're not traveling to the Amazon, you do yeah. need something you can take home from those things that's actionable that you can use to reset yourself and being able to follow my breath or sit quietly in a dark room or pump, put in binaural beats while I'm driving, like whatever yeah. the case is just to fucking calm my mind so that I can allow the answer to come up rather than try to think my way through the situation or yeah. I'll fucking figure this out. <laughs> Never fucking works. You know, that I know, spirals it's like, into countless that's like, thoughts. That's such like, that's such an, such an expression of the masculine too. Like I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to, I'm just going to, Alan Watts laugh, jokes about this in, in some of his talks. He's like, you're going to squint and you're going to try really hard and, and think. And, and it's like, just fucking relax and let it, let it go. Let it be. And then be present with it. You know, and especially in those times, I remember uh, we were in Miami a couple weeks ago for uh, for Liv's, my girlfriend's birthday, and homegirl was super hungover on the way back and throwing up in the airport, and we missed our flight, and I, th I was able to take the whole view of the thing and just be like, this is an opportunity to show a lot of compassion for somebody who's already having a hard time. Like, there's literally no good that's going to come from me giving her more shit about this. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. you know, and I was like, I, just, I turned it into like an eight hour mindfulness practice of like, well, now I'm really hungry and we should be home by now, but it's okay. It's just going to be a funny story in a little while. And was able to just, and then, you know, a couple of days later, I remember saying like, you were really great <laughs> through all that bullshit. But it was because I was able to look at it, view at it, view it as an opportunity for a little bit of growth and something that could be kind of silly versus that knee jerk response of it should be different. You know, yeah. that word should sneaks in a lot of these things and it's, yeah. you can kind of just create, uh, create a little bit of space, man. That's what it comes down to. So your first experience was really, really cool. And, and I think at that point, I don't want to say you were hooked cause that's kind of can have negative connotations, but you were intrigued, I would assume. I was, yeah, I think hooked sounds better than intrigued, even though it has the negative context. I think, you know, the first time I discovered it, it was like, I was in disbelief almost yeah. like this fucking exists i'm <laughs> exactly. fucking 33 exactly. years old <laughs> and i've gone through life my entire life never knowing that this exists like never knowing like you can get to a place where there's communication and and you know for the for the sam harris's out there that oh it's just your mind being unlocked it's already in your brain you're asking yourself questions and you're answering those questions fucking cool cool it still works it still works <laughs> yeah cool like i'm i'm not getting those answers out of that space. And yeah. the more often I've done ayahuasca, the more I've been able to get those answers out of that space because of meditation and these practices, mm -hmm. which I've learned the importance of from ayahuasca, you know? And I think that, but yeah, the first time it's just like, fuck dude, like this is here. Like this is, this is the most transformative thing I've ever done in my entire life. I had no idea it existed two mm -hmm. months prior. And, and just to continue with that, like it's different every time it's something new every time well then it doesn't it such a good practice too when you go into each ceremony and this is goes across the board with me in, in psychedelic experience is that i don't have a choice but to take on a beginner's mindset because i don't if i start making assumptions as to what i'm going to experience i'm going to be proven wrong yeah so I, get to, I have to bring it back down like you were saying like i'm an infant yeah. And have to go into it with a complete beginner's mindset, just open to learning or else I'll try and construct things. And that has ended poorly in the past and without as much learning, the more yeah. assumptions I have going in, the less I, I take away. I think there's, there's a few, there's a few key points that kind of go into most ayahuasca ceremonies. One, you don't control it. You don't control shit. Yeah. So let go and surrender are like giant take home lessons <laughs> every time I do it. And for the bulk of people, mm -hmm. Surrendering to it, knowing that you are not in control at all and you'll go for the ride that Aya wants to take you on, that's that's a big one. Yeah. But like like airing to what you say, like when you set your intention, the more specific that intention is, 
the less likely I've seen that come through. And that's not just from my experience. It's from listening to 10 to 20 to 55 people when I was in uh, Panama speak about their experience. And the people that said, like, I want to talk to my dead grandmother <laughs> didn't get to see their dead grandmother. Yeah. The people that had an intention like, I want to learn how to love myself more or I need to forgive my parents for my upbringing or whatever the case may be, the broader the stroke, the more information that came in, yeah. the more specific, the more disappointment because you don't control. I mean, you could talk to your fucking dead grandmother, Yeah. but it's likely not going to be on your radar, you know, yeah. or, not, or it's not, it's definitely not going to be on your terms. Yeah. There's yeah. no like, yeah, oh, I'm requesting this exactly to happen. And then, you know, I think that there can be like a little slap on the wrist, you know, uh, whether that's just, uh, yourself giving you the slap on the wrist, the plant spirit or whatever you want to call it. You know, I think that there's, there's more of a struggle when you try yeah. to control it and figure like, no, nah, this is not what I want to see. I want to go through something else. And I've, I've seen that many times with people that they go through, they relive something that they didn't want to relive, you know? And I think that's, that's part of it too. And I, when I spoke with, uh, Rick Doblin, uh, the head of MAPS, Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, yeah. we were talking about good trips versus bad trips. And it was either him or Dennis McKenna or maybe both of them, but they were saying, you know, the idea of the bad trip happens when you think you're going to take this substance and feel a certain way. Like, I'm going to take mushrooms and feel great and have a good time and laugh my ass off. And then some shit comes up that you don't want to deal with. Yeah. Right? And so that becomes a bad trip. Or wrong mindset, wrong setting, all the stuff that you hear about from Timothy Leary and, and everyone else in this space. But if you if you kind of set the table where you have the right mindset going into it, you're in the right environment, you have some caretakers, babysitters, whatever you need, guides, shaman. If the, if the wheels are greased and you're ready to go, I think you can get a lot from it. And then that bad trip, there might be a hard time, as they say. It might yeah. be difficult. Chal challenging experience. Yeah, it might be difficult, yeah. but it's not going to be a bad experience. It's going to be good in the end because you'll see that with new eyes. Exactly. Exactly. So you, how many ceremonies did you do in that first encounter? Uh, they were used to do like a monthly thing, and I'd go, uh, I think I did, I want to say eight ceremonies spread out over a year to a year and a half. Oh, so you were doing one at a time and spreading them out. Yeah. And then know? I, uh, so we I did three a, back to back my first time around to, I went to, I was looking to open a gym in central and South America because I figured Brazil had Brazil and the U S had MMA gyms on lock. So I looked in Peru, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Panama. Okay. And I spent a week in each place and I was looking to open a gym there where I could be closer to the plants, you know, but still yeah. in a main space. So obviously the flight from, Lima, Peru, uh, you know, a couple hours and then a boat ride is not that bad to mm -hmm. get to Iquitos as opposed to, um, you know, having to fly all the way from the U.S., that kind of thing. So that's yeah, kind of where my from the U.S. is definitely that's that's where my mind was at. And um, when I got there, I realized a few things like one, we're not moving here. <laughs> Two, they, the cult, the cult, the level of respect from the populated areas for those cultures is non-existent. Like they, in highly populated areas in Peru and Colombia, they look at the indigenous as like fucking hillbillies drinking moonshine. Yeah, you know, there, there's not a level of res the same reverence and level of respect that we have for them. You know, mm -hmm. and so um, that that was that was not good. So, anyways, when I figured out that I wasn't gonna um, open up a gym there. I was like, well, I'm in the right spot. Let, let's find some places to do ceremonies. Yeah. And I was able to do a couple in Colombia, which were beautiful because they use different plant medicines from the, you know, West coast to Ecuador to the East coast of Brazil. It changes, yeah. you know, they have different concoctions, different plants that they use. And I really got to experience quite a wide variety of different, uh, methods and just see the different cultural use of that. And there's a great book that I'd read, um, the Cosmic Serpent by Jeremy Narby. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he talked quite a bit about that, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how Westerners who go down to the Amazon are often disappointed because they expect this super visionary thing to happen and they end up just throwing up the whole night and they don't have this beautiful <laughs> experience, you know? And one of the reasons is it's often, it's often talked about these wonderful experiences with Shipibo Shaman in particular, because they have a higher degree of knowledge, they have a higher degree of DMT in their brew. So that gives you that truly, you know, beautiful, euphoric, visionary experience that, that I think people read about, hear us talking about, that kind yeah. of thing. And uh, so just to give an example, my 
ninth ceremony was my first in Colombia. I had two cups of ayahuasca. They call it yaje in Colombia. It tasted like mud. Oh. And it went down so thick. And I I shit the entire night like water, Ooh. like a faucet out of my ass mm. for like eight hours and puked violently, had zero visions, zero communication. <laughs> but there was this level of peace. And because I had, ex- I mean, if that was my first ceremony, I'd have been like, fuck this stuff. I'm yeah. never doing it again. You know, but because it happened when it did and because I had read that book, I understood like, hey, this is a possibility. And then when it was happening, I thought one of my intentions was to clean myself out and to detox. Mm-hmm. Check mark. We got that. Yeah. So I, I, I did get that. And maybe that's what I needed because two nights later, I had a very beautiful experience. Absolutely yeah. incredible. I think the, trust, if, you were, if you're with great facilitators or shamans, you got to trust the experience too. Like I had that when I, we went to Peru and it was my first time drinking in Peru. I had what I considered to be kind of a, of like a, it wasn't super experiential. It wasn't a very heavy experience. wasn't a lot of visions. But as I reflect on it later, it was exactly what I needed at the time because we were really, it was like I said something funny, but it was kind of like scrolling through my Instagram feed into my visions. It was just all the noise in my head was just getting projected in front of my face. And I had some really great, some really short, fast, transformative visions. But when I went into Wachuma, which was really the, the primary medicine we were working with down there at the time, my whole mind and body was clear. And it was actually my first time to purge. So that was my fourth ceremony I've ever, I'd ever done. Um, and it was our first time purging. And it was, it was really interesting because the, the first time, the first time I'd gone around was three ceremonies back to back. And I felt like the, I had expected to purge and, and, and wasn't, you know, was not, wasn't really scared of shitting myself. Like I had kind of letting go of that. But what happened was it felt like the medicine just stuck in my stomach like a knot and was just working on me the whole weekend. Like mm-hmm. I just had this really tense stomach and it, and it, it cleared out after the last night. Like it was, it definitely felt like it was, it was working on me. And then the, this, the time in Peru was just a complete, the whole thing was like clearing out all the noise and just working for this final purge. And I didn't purge till the very end. And it was, I was so grateful to let all of that go. And it was, it was work. It was hard. I was sweating. I was crying. I was vomiting finally. And was just, I was just in between bouts of purging. I was just saying, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Cause it was yeah. just, it was out of me. And it was, but it was, and I didn't, it felt like a mild experience, but in re, in reflection was absolutely perfect. Yeah. And I, feel, I think the purge is something that like prior to going into it, you're like, I don't want to fucking do that. That sounds, that sounds bad. And then you're like, well, if I get this cool thing from it, then maybe it's worth it. Mm-hmm. And then like, once you have a purge, you're like, oh, that's, that's awesome. Like that's a cool part of the experience. And it really is an important part of the experience too. I I had a a period of like one year I think I'd done five ceremonies in that year and uh, I hadn't purged. I mean, I had purged through crying. I had purged through shitting, but I mm-hmm. hadn't purged by throwing up. And anytime I would hear people, I would feel jealousy. It's the only time I'd feel jealousy yeah, in a ceremony right? where I was like, fuck, I want to purge. And I remember trying and like, you know, and like, like a little air comes out and they're like, oh, maybe it's just psychic energy. And I'm like, no, I know what that purge is too. And it wasn't that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like just like you, it's like the harder you try, the more the harder with the more it'd be like no, it yeah, just stays and he's yeah, like, no, you'll I'm get not it, you'll it. get it when you get it, yeah. you know. But I mean, it, like when it happens, like it is a weight lifted off your mm. chest. It yeah. is, it's it's magic. It's a beautiful part of the fucking experience. Yeah. And and even like doing five grams of ground psilocybin, which I think is absolutely transformative and one of the best experiences I've ever had with with plant medicines. Um, there's no purge there. You know, so that is something like I didn't, I didn't having experienced that. I wasn't like, oh man, I didn't purge because I didn't expect that. It's not a part of the deal. Yeah. But that is something that draws me to ayahuasca because it is. And when you go through that, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of the equation, you know. And mushrooms are funny too. Like they're, they're a very comfortable teacher to me. Like I feel very... Almost like it's an uncle. I call it like Uncle Mushroom, just as a Uncle Mushroom. Uncle Mushroom, because <laughs> you kind of feel like you get these like, these weird little like nuggets of wisdom that like a relative would give you, and you're like, okay, you can take that with me. And it, it sometimes are challenging experiences, but I have a really good relationship with it. Uh-huh. Where ayahuasca is, it's almost like this like master splinter that will tell you what you want to hear or what you need to hear, even if you don't want it. Like it's, uh-huh. and it, it'll show you. You get to see it and really experience it. And that's one thing that I really feel the power of ayahuasca is actually feeling the experience 
like yeah. putting yourself there. Yeah, you go through it, you live the experience. Exactly. Right. And I don't that I mean, just to put it into like a visionary standpoint, like I lived as my mother. Yeah. I lived as my wife. I lived as other people for a t- a t- a, you know, in time, in the visionary experience, you could fucking live a lifetime yeah. in that in that one 30 second blip. I don't even know, you know, it's not like we got a stopwatch going like, Hey, <laughs> the vision just started. Somebody hit start. It's not you know, like, Oh, it ended. Oh, it was 15 minutes. Oh, that was only 15 seconds. Like it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like how you're, you're in that thing and you see it from all angles. And when you come out of that, that that's all the change in yeah. the world. And you don't, I have not experienced that with other medicines. No, same here. Well, and you, I mean, you met your children, right? That's right. Yeah. We, uh, so another thing that I'd read in the Cosmic Serpent was, you know, when, when scientists were studying uh, the vine, which is what they actually call ayahuasca, Banisteriopsis capi, they wanted to name two of the alkaloids um, telepathine. And later they found out, oh, these have already been named harmine and harmaline. Okay. But the reason they wanted to name it telepathine was because of the fact that people had reported having similar or the same exact visions when they had went into ceremony in the same room. Ah, okay. And so I'd read about that and had never experienced it. And then, you know, at the end of these ceremonies, people oftentimes will speak about their experience in front of the group. And so Natasha was like, yeah, I had, um, I had a really beautiful vision of Kyle holding a baby and I was holding the two of them. And I was like, hold on. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I had the exact same vision, you know, and at the very next ceremony, um, we both shared the very same vision, but it was a boy. And I was like, Oh fuck. Like right in the vision I see I'm holding the boy now and Tasha's holding us same exact vision but it's a boy and it's like crystal clear now. It's not like vague. Yeah. You know, kind of uh I don't know, like a, like a photo through a steam room. Like it wasn't foggy at all. It was yeah. crystal clear like I'm going to have a boy and I just freaked the fuck out. Like I was like, "Oh shit. I don't have medical insurance. I live in my mom's garage. Uh, <laughs> where's the baby going to go? Oh, we don't have a savings account. Like all this shit started going through my head and it just, the fear snowballed at an incredible rate. And my heart started racing and I was like, what the fuck? Oh, oh. like short of breath, everything like that. And I just took one deep breath and I thought, oh, wait a minute. That's not my fear. That's what everyone else tells you to fear. Yeah. Like that's what society like says. Cultural you gotta have your ducks in a row. <laughs> Better have your fucking 401k and you're this and you're that, you know, and your dental plan and all this shit. And it was like, there is no perfect time to have children. If no. everyone waited, there would be no fucking kids. There'd yeah. be no reproduction. Kids come when the time is right, not when you think it's right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you're a testament to that, right? Yeah. You're a fucking great dude. You're here <laughs> on accident. And whether you want to, I think there are no accidents or mistakes, but, yeah. but, um, certainly not planned for those kind of things. Right. Yeah. And, um, so to, to, to kind of realize that, like, and have that fear just move away from me instantly, like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, cool. I'm going to be a fucking dad. This is awesome. And, uh, you know, we pulled the goalie and a month later we were pregnant with little bear just <laughs> like that. So, and uh, <laughs> funny situation having him there in our studio apartment, detached garage. But uh, yeah, you know, sleep training is is <laughs> it's, it's a little bit hard when he can stand up in his crib and point at you while he cries until you pull him back into bed with you. Yeah. But um, yeah, he's been a total blessing. You know, he's a fucking amazing kid. And um, bears a G. I like yeah, the kid. <laughs> it's, it's it's just he, you know he's a gift to us, and yeah. uh, he's one of my greatest teachers. And, you know, I, I think that's directly from, this was at a point when we were just dating, Yeah, you know, we were living together. It was serious, but we hadn't talked about marriage. We hadn't mm-hmm. talked about kids other than we know we want them someday, you know, like yeah. always down the road someday. So to have that, like almost implanted into our minds, like now, mm-hmm. now is okay right now. And then boom, next month. Oh, now we're pregnant. Now we're parents. Now we get to go through this together and continue mm-hmm. to learn and to try to give to bear what, what we didn't have given us to try yeah. to learn and to try to be better versions of ourselves. So he has the best parents he possibly can, you know? Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting that you go, you went through that experience and that's deeper in your journey than I've, than I've gone with mine. But a lot of the work I did on the front end with, with my initial ayahuasca experiences were was just reconciling stuff with my parents, you know? And I don't think I've actually talked about this a ton on the podcast, but my dad uh, is in prison for, I think he's got like, two more years so seven years my parents were both at, at addicts whenever i was born so i grew up with my grandparents who were super young and, and awesome 
Uh, but I just had this, my second night, the first night was so loving and I needed that. I think I, that was perfect. I was really scared. Um, I'd gone like on a short notice, like I had two days notice. Somebody listened to the story of how I ended up in this. So I'd put my name on a waiting list and they're like, yeah, you're probably not going to be able to go, but you know, I'm on the waiting list, whatever. I'm just owning my gym, doing my thing. And I find out on Wednesday that I'm, I can go on Friday to this, uh, this retreat center. And like, damn it, I shouldn't eat in pork. I know. I was like, well, I better stop smoking weed and having sex for a couple of days. <laughs> uh, so I did. And I was like, I got it all together and I got some people to sub the classes at the gym. And it was because a friend of mine, his sister had a baby a week early. Mm. So he had, he went and did that. And he had, to, and I, so I just took a spot, which is, which is crazy. It's super like kind of random, but that's the way ayahuasca seems to work. And I was just in the process of realizing that I had to close my gym. Like I'd, I'd finally like, made the decision so it was perfect and the first night was a lot of it was a lot, like i was the last one to drink a cup as well and I, everybody was cackling and laughing and vomiting by the time i even had any experiences and i was just scared it was it was so loud it was like i was in the jungle it was just incredibly scary and i had this huge wave of just peace come over me and it was i say like i was like getting spooned by the mother yeah and i start hearing this voice saying it's okay sweetheart it's like i'm not i was like it's not always going to be this easy but i'll always be here and just that kind of kept playing on a loop. And it had a very feminine experience, but I was like, okay. I was like, the guard was down. I felt a home with it. Um, and then the next night was just super dark. And I this, I can't like put a, a shape to it or, or anything like that or a face to it, but this dark entity kind of came up and very early on in the experience and was like, I have you, I have your brother, I have your dad, and I've had everyone that you, before you even knew something like that i was like let's fucking do this like let's dance motherfucker like it was that was my mentality i'm like let's go so i just ended up like fighting this this darkness for three hours i'm shaking sweating like i can just feel the veins like popping out of my neck my head's like, kind of against a wall and just so much resistance and just fighting this darkness fight 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 and uh i finally just get exhausted i'm just physically emotionally mentally just it's exhausted. And then I see my dad and my brother. My brother and I are about a year apart, but my dad was my age. And uh, I hadn't spoken to him probably for two over two years at this point. And uh, in my vision, and then we all just hugged and we're crying. And then it just, poof, the whole thing was over. That was it. And I was like, oh, you can't beat this shit with violence and resistance and hate. Like, that's not how this works. And that was the week before Thanksgiving. And I saw my dad, went to, went to the prison, saw my dad for the first time in three years that next weekend. And well, I was, it was funny because I was looking at him through glass. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was looking in a fucking mirror. I was like, oh, I get it now. Like I was, I didn't like the things about you that I didn't like about myself. Yeah. That came from you. And by having compassion for both of us, I can, I can really see this for what it is. And man, that was so incredible. So incredible. And then and the next night was a lot of stuff about my mom. And it was just like just compassion all the way around. And it's it's really changed the way that I view myself, my parents, my relationships, my ability to be a parent, like the way that I can bring myself to any any relationship with anybody, friends or romantic. It was it was super transformative. But it came with that like aha moment of love, man. And then that's why I had this love tattoo on my forearm. That's where it came from. <laughs> it's that that's moment. beautiful, brother. It was it was wild, but it's, it's funny that you, I reconciled that because I feel like there's this place in the future for raising badass kids and and be able to share love in that way. And, and through this podcast and the work we do, it's it's awesome. It's, I'm just super grateful for all of it. But it came with these like that three hour fight with with darkness, dude. It's it's crazy when you were telling me that. I was totally thinking that this the only time. I've had an experience where shit kind of hit the fan in this physical reality during a ceremony. I was, uh, I forget which it was, I don't know, maybe 12 or 13, something like that. But, um, I remember, um, the shaman touching my foot and he was like, Kyle, how are you brother? And I was like, Oh, I'm amazing. And I saw the word gratitude in gold letters. <laughs> Even as I opened my eyes, I saw it like total gratitude. Right. And I just like fucking beam me up like, yes, I'm doing great. Thank you so much, brother. And, uh, and he's like, um, do you think you can stand? 
And I was like, yeah, yeah. Do you need me to help with something? I thought he needed me to bring in like food. I didn't know like how far we were along, if we were going to have, like they had soup at the end and fruit, mm-hmm. those kind of things. I was like, I can help. And he's like, okay. And uh, Tasha looked at me and she's like, Paul, are you okay? Like you're, you're fucking in it. Like I'm in it. Are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I'm, it's okay. So I get up and I've, I think something resonated with her much sooner than me. Mm-hmm. I was just like, dopey hunky dork hey yeah. what do you need buddy let's go take care of something <laughs> and so i get up and uh he pulls me away from the group and he says um so there was a man who um he doesn't speak english a spanish-speaking man and um he's reliving some trauma from his father and it's i guess his his dad like beat the shit out of him his whole mm-hmm. life and so every time he closed his eyes he would relive that and mm. so he was like, fuck this. I'm not, I don't want to see that, you know, and he gets up and, uh, but he was like, no men could come to him. He started getting super violent. So I guess he had taken off and run away from the Maloka and he Ooh. grabbed a fucking shovel. And so we're, as we're walking towards him, they're explaining this to me. Like he's unapproachable. He's swinging a shovel at the other guides. And I was like, oh, shit. Like, it just fucking switched in an instant. In my mind, I was like, oh, they need me to help that way. Like, I got to fucking take this guy out. Yeah. And then it was like all the thoughts of my fight career. Like, how do we do this? Okay. Like, I'm going to wait for him to swing, take him down. If I have to choke him out, then I'll do that. Yeah. Get the fucking weapon away from him. And, like, really methodically planning this attack. You know, and as I approached him, I saw the same thing that you did in the spirit world, in the visionary state. Yeah. Like when I looked at this guy, I thought like I could choke this guy out 30 fucking times. He's still going to wake up going bad shit crazy. Mm -hmm. More violence with what this guy's seeing right now is not going to fucking change the way he's feeling inside. It's not going to change his experience at all. It'll only make it worse. And so I stood out there, like, at a distance and just told him, like, it's okay, it's W N, it's W N, it's okay. And then finally he set the shovel down and uh, he took off. You know, he ran away from the group and uh, we just went back and he ended up coming back later. And he had a lot of remorse because he realized kind of, you know, how far off the register he went, you know, like how far off yeah. the deep end. But it was that realization, too. Like, ah, I'm not going to beat this guy. I'm not going to fucking fix him with violence. I'm not going to settle him down. The same reason he got down. there. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's exactly what put him in that place. Like, he just yeah. needed love and compassion to know, like, he's safe. And I totally understand why that could have been a bad trip for him because yeah. he wasn't ready to see that. You know, and I think a big thing for people to understand homework-wise before they do something like that is to realize whatever you've stuffed down whatever you've not allowed to come to the surface, whatever shit's gone on in your life, there's a great potential for that to come up. There's a great potential for the curtain to be yanked back upon yourself with your inner mind and to release everything you've been stuffing away (laughs) your entire lifetime to come back up again, you know? And and, uh, if you're okay with that, if you're okay with seeing that stuff, then that's all the difference in the world because then when it comes up, you can appreciate it for what it is and see it with new eyes. But if you resist that, then you take off running down the street looking for a shovel to swing at people. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. You can, you can, yeah, exactly. I'm glad, I'm glad that mine was all in the, in the <laughs> astral. I wasn't actually yeah. rolling around on the ground fighting <laughs> darkness. <laughs> Man, that's a wild thing though. And that's, that's, that's such a lesson for the world. Like this violence just breeds more violence and it just spirals into normalcy. And that's the scary part. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I don't know. You know, um, it's, it's tough. It's a tough thing. You know, I, I do, I see things from all angles more often than I used to. I can't draw a hard line in the sand on Mm. violence or protecting oneself, things like that. I think, um, you know, I've done a lot of tours for the military where I go over and that's how I met my wife. You know, we'd go overseas and support our troops, you know, show, show them love, teach them moves jujitsu wise, take photos, that kind of <laughs> yeah, shit. Yeah. Um, Tosh was obviously the, the hot piece, hot piece for the photographs. But uh, uh, look at us dating the hot pieces. <laughs> the hot pieces. <laughs> but um, 
but yeah, you know, like those were great things. And then, you know, as I, as I spoke about my experience with ayahuasca and Rogan's and different things, like people would write me and say like, well, I don't understand how you can go support the military and violence and war and all. And yeah. It's like, first of all, these guys aren't the ones that are, that are saying, sign me up to, to fucking go overseas and fight and, you know, things like that. But they're definitely down. They're, Tim Kennedy's down. Yeah. Nobody's going to say no. Jocko Willink's down. Yeah. But they don't decide when they go to war, you know? And the, the truth is, like, everyone needs love and compassion. And the other thing is, there are people on this earth that will fucking cut your head off. We don't live in a utopia. And I think Aubrey's example of the rose, when he talks mm -hmm. about, you know, when you walk by a rose, it doesn't shoot its thorns out at you. It doesn't whip you with a fucking, mm -hmm. with the lash of the, of the yeah. stem. But if you go to grab that thing, the thorns are there right it protects itself yeah and i see that i see that's valuable in nature and it's valuable in where we're at today because we're not in a place where everyone's on the same page where it's all love and it's all good and um you know it doesn't mean i'm i go out looking for trouble or have a chip on my shoulder certainly not and certainly not now but um you know it's, it's just not that easy to say this is right this is wrong this is how we should respond and all that other yeah. stuff and i think know? i think the big you know, and this is something I took away from that because I had that same kind of that same kind of uh, conundrum thinking of when I when I saw that and, and and felt the the way that toxic violence can really perpetuate itself. But I think if it, when we just because we we look at things through a lens of love, that gives us a little bit of space to make accurate decisions. But it doesn't mean that war doesn't happen. It doesn't mean that fights don't happen. Sometimes the best thing for somebody I know I've been punched in the face when I deserved it, and it was probably the best thing for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's that's how it goes sometimes but i think they're trying to create empathy and understanding might create some space where we the violence becomes net is, is only what's necessary yeah well you know? and part of that too is is the need to be right yeah like as soon as you drop the need to be right 100 where's the fucking argument you know what i'm saying like cool your god's better than mine your understanding of what happens when we die is more accurate than mine and neither one of us has died and come back but somehow <laughs> you know better than i do that's fucking cool i don't need to prove you wrong i don't need to say like what about this inconsistency what about this contradiction what about this what about that like there those are things that i can talk with with people about who are willing to talk with me about that yeah but if i have that conversation as long as I can be comfortable with not needing to be right, as long as I can be comfortable with not needing to prove you wrong, that really takes the heat out of the discussion. Yep. And whatever, you know, spawns from that, right, from that discussion in both needing to be right, that's usually where shit starts to go <laughs> a little wacky, right? Yeah. Like that so much belief in, in your own personal thing and so much attachment and identity to the thing you've grown up with that you're willing to kill someone else over it. Yeah. You know, and, or so much pain inside that you think other people should die. Like r really, you know, yeah, to, 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 to establish your righteousness, your right. Yeah. How many millions and millions <laughs> and millions of fucking people have died because of that. Yeah. You know, I think that's a great, a great lesson for everyone is just to, to let go of the need of being right. Yeah. You know, and to know, to know your audience, like to know, like, if I'm talking to my mom and she tells me she wants to eat a certain way and doesn't want to listen to me about health and wellness or diet and nutrition or any of the things that I think I have a decent knowledge base on, that's okay. She yeah. gets to walk her own path. She gets to do whatever the fuck she wants to because it's her life, right? And that's yep. cool. Like, I don't have to fix her. All I have to do is fix me. And if I can do that, if I can be the best version of myself I possibly can be, then that's something they can they can witness. That's something where I can lead by example. That's something where they can gain from simply because I had focused on bettering myself. I think that's that's a big that's a big teaching to circle back around ayahuasca is a big teaching I took away from from my experiences is that we are all part of this collective consciousness, this this one big thing. And with the life that I have and, and the really I feel like the only thing that I have is a body. Like my, my consciousness is part of this bigger picture. And if I can bring value and love and compassion to that in whatever way that, that, that is in front of me, then I'm adding to that collective and I can bring that whatever way. And that's through compassion, compassion and understanding and, and detaching my identity from being right. And that's okay. 
And that's good. And that's beautiful. And then with that, you can lead with that. You can be a person of influence. Yeah. Yeah, It's, it's the understanding of not necessarily needing to be right, but also the realization that you can get to the same place through many different paths. Mm -hmm. You can grow from many different ways. And there's, same thing with fucking diet. There's no one right diet for everyone, you know? Like, it's, it's different for everybody. But there are some general rules that yeah. would apply to everybody, and, <laughs> and they do well for them. And, uh, you know, same thing goes with, with the plants. I think there's, and and chemicals outside of plants, like LSD and MDMA, have, have been phenomenal in their own way. You know, mm-hmm. not as transformative, but absolutely beautiful teachers when done in the right context. Yep. And um, if there's something, you know, some a lot of people... This is something I wanted to talk about too on the ayahuasca discussion today. <laughs> Let's go. A lot of people that say they've done, I, I tried ayahuasca or I did ayahuasca once and it's not for me. Or I did ayahuasca and I don't feel called to do it again. How many times did you do it? Oh, I did one ceremony back a year ago or back whenever. And so, oh, so it was one night only. Like, cool, awesome that you did mm-hmm. the one night. That, t- that took balls, no doubt. But... There is some some layering that happens when you go every other night or back to back to back. Mm-hmm. And truly, like, 22 times for me, it has changed me tremendously. And I know there's far more work to be done. And, you know, I talked to the shaman's apprentice who had done it over 150 times, and he said the same shit. Yeah. It's like, I've lived in the Amazon for six years. I've done it over 150 times. He goes, I'm just now ask, asking for permission to do it alone. I'm just mm-hmm. now asking for be able to. I was the first person he sang a private healing Icaros to. Those are so amazing. They are amazing, <laughs> right? But I was like, dude, you're legendary. That's yeah. the first time ever. That's awesome. You've only done this for groups. You've never done an individual. And he was like, "That you were the first. So like, the, it just it just keeps going, you know? But But what I was getting to is... I don't fully understand it yet and I don't know that I will and that's okay. But to do it once and to say like, no, it's not for me or no, I didn't, you know, like that kind of thing. It's like, I think, you know, if you're comparing, cause you're not going to travel all the way to Peru and do it once. Yeah. So to pony up the cash, to take the time off work, to, to find a babysitter or to have your, your kids stay with your parents, whatever the case may be, it's worth it to go down there and to dive balls deep into it and to really disconnect from Facebook and your job and all these things and to spend even five days. But really, you know, if you can spend a week or two, dive deep, do three, do four, do five ceremonies, and then form the opinion on ayahuasca and then then really do the homework on ayahuasca. You know, I had a, um, a sports psychologist that I worked with who would do some of these ceremonies with me uh, when I was fighting and one of the things he said was, you know, you don't need to, like a lot, a lot of people feel <laughs> that, you know, when they have the discussion after about what they saw, they'll word things in the way of, we, ayahuasca told me that we need to do this differently. We need to have this happen. We need to use less paper. We, we're burning through too many trees. We're doing this wrong. The message is for you. It's yeah. like the fucking Oracle in the matrix. I need to do this differently. I need to change this about my life. Not we, I, you know, and, uh, I think just understanding that makes a big difference. But at the same time, his, what he was, what I'm getting to is he was telling me like, if you can let people know in a way that's not invasive and not coaching anybody or offering unsolicited advice yeah. pre-ceremony, it's, it's to say that what you gain in the ceremony only works if it's something that you can take with you in your everyday life. If you don't do the homework that ayahuasca gives you, if you don't, You use it to transform your life in the daily practices in between ceremonies and after the ceremony, then all it is is a fucking cool memory you had of traveling to the Amazon or going to some shaman's house in New York City. It's a fucking roller coaster. It's fleeting. Yeah. It was this, it was this dope time where I saw this snake and blah, blah, blah happened. And that's it, right? It's not, it's not transformative if you don't do the work. And I've found personally that the more frequently that I did ceremonies, had I had I not, you know, say I had an intention and I got some answers and I didn't put those into practice and I went back to do ayahuasca again just because it's, hey, it's on the schedule, let's do it. 
I would get the same information from ayahuasca <laughs> again. Like, yeah. listen, bitch, you didn't do this stuff I told you a month ago. Or, yeah. you know, like, hey, uh, it's cool that you've got new stuff that you want answers on, but remember this thing you asked me about last time? <laughs> <laughs> you haven't done shit with it. Yeah. You know? So it's it's funny how that works, but that's and that's been my personal experience with it. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't do it you know, often it doesn't mean that you can't, but it, it does mean that whatever you gain from that, make sure that it, it applies to everyday living Yeah, because that that's the most change that can happen from things like that. Absolutely, man. Well, dude, that hour flew by. Fuck yeah, brother. Shit. Killed it. I'm going to do another one of these. We need to do one from the jungle. Yes. I'm, I'm way down. There. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, there. first quarter of 2018 we yeah. go. We were talking about that today. Yeah, buddy. <sighs> Let's make it happen. 16 days. Yeah. <laughs> three three ayahuascas every other night, two-day break, three wachuma every other night, and then vilka. Vilka. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, brother, you, uh, you've made some changes since last time you were on the show, so uh, tell everybody where they can find you. That's right. They well, I'm, your still, sweet, seductive I'm, voice. S- I'm still at Kings Boo on Twitter and Instagram. Um, find me there. If I'm on, if I'm on Facebook, I'm not really on Facebook. I'm uh, uh Director of Human Optimization now at Onnit. I run the Onnit podcast, so we uh, have a podcast that launches every Monday, mostly on health and wellness. Uh, I get to talk about the nitty gritty, fun, transformative stuff with guys like you, and of course on the <laughs> Aubrey Marcus podcast. Yeah. Um, but uh, definitely, you know, like like if if we think of this pyramid of how we can grow and how we can get the most out of life, that base tier, that foundation, is our health. Because without our health, we have nothing. You know, if you're in pain every day, it really trickles into your emotions, your mental state, how you fucking live, all that, right? Mm-hmm. So how we tackle our health, how we tackle our strength, our mobility, our ability to eat in a way that promotes cognitive function and helps us think and allows us to learn and retain information, like all those steps leading up to pretty much that last piece where we talk about on shows like yours and Aubrey's, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, the on a podcast, we've, we've got some really great guests, um, talking about health and wellness, diet, nutrition, supplements, meditation practices, breath work, things that are a part of my everyday life. Like anything that I would use outside of plant medicines to enhance my quality of life. That's really what it's about. And obviously I used to fight, so we've got some fighters on, Yeah, but the fighters, you know, I, to be honest, I could give a shit about your next fight. You know, it's, it's yeah. more about, how did you get to this position? You know, what is the mindset that that it took to become a champion? Well, what that's, is your one, that's, that's one thing I love about the show that you're ho- you're hosting now with on it is is that you get you know the behind the scenes, so you get into the nitty gritty stuff, the questions that most people don't know don't know how to ask, and it's super informative, and you can take so much away from that. Because one thing I talk about in this show a lot is the path to success has a few of the same underpinnings, no matter what that success is as a fighter in your life, in your relationships, in finances, it could be anything. In psychedelic experiences, there's certain things to be taken away from that journey, and, and you're able to share those in a, in a kick-ass way, along with being a human guinea pig up here, which is really fun yeah. to watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got to do it. You know, It's not enough to, to, to know. We must do. I try and dabble a little bit and tag along, but your you're, you're balls deep, my friend. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to get balls deep. <laughs> well, dude, thanks for kicking in, and uh, we'll get you on here again soon. Awesome, brother. Thanks right. for having me, Connor. Later on, brother. And that's our show. If you love it, guys, go ahead and head over to iTunes. Give us a five-star review. Leave some kind words. Those always, always make my day. And uh, they just manifest a little kindness in the universe. Now, if you're curious about psychedelics and ayahuasca and where to go, how to access it, what are some do's and don'ts, you can head over to the Pleasure Monkey Live Facebook group. Those are discussions we've had in the community. A lot of people in that community are willing to share their experiences, the do's and don'ts, great locations, practitioners. And it's really been an eye-opening experience for me to bring so many people together that have such a diverse experience with plant medicines and shamanic practices. And some people that don't and are not interested in that at all. But it's always, always something to learn from the lessons of those who have dove deep into their own subconscious. So if you love that, guys, all you have to do is go to Facebook, search Pleasure Monkey Life, and request access. It is free for the first 1,000 members. We're getting pretty close. We're definitely about, uh, I think, like two-thirds of the way there now. So get in while you can, and uh, hopefully you'll see you there. And I hope you have an amazing day. 
See you next time. Peace.